Welcome to Rockstar Doctor Life. I'm Melissa Longo. As a chiropractor, I believe we have the profound ability to impact our communities and people's health on a global level, while also enjoying rich and rewarding personal lives and giving attention to the things that matter to us. Each week, you'll hear an inspiring conversation to give you ideas and insights to rock your practice, pursue your passions, find more connection and meaning in your life, and create a life and business that works for you. Hey there, Docs. I'm thrilled, as always, to have you here with me, listening to another conversation with an amazing chiropractor who's doing some really cool things in his community and even internationally. Joining me today is Dr. Jay Warren. Hey, Jay. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great. I always love having other podcasters on the show because I, don't I know love about it you. too. I love connecting with podcasters. So yeah, it's, it's great uh, for us to connect. It's kind of fun for you to be on the receiving end of questions, I think. Yes, <laughs> it's much easier. Well, I think it's easier because <laughs> yeah. I don't have to prep anything. Just fire away and yeah. I'll hopefully have answers. <laughs> um, well, obviously, the first thing for docs who don't know what you're up to and what you're doing, if you could just give us a snapshot of, you know, who is Dr. Jay Warren? What are you doing these days in your life and practice? And we'll go from there. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm out in San Diego, California. I'm a born and raised uh, Southern California boy. So I got spoiled growing up here and has stayed ever since. And I'm a pediatric and prenatal chiropractor. So 90% of my day is pregnant women and postpartum and babies uh, under a year. And it's it's been amazing. I've been doing this concentrated in this niche for the last three, four years. And I just love it. I mean, it, my whole career has kind of been building towards this and I've been wanting to do it. And things sh- shifted in a couple years ago go with the birth of my son. <laughs> He's four now. And it's I'm doing everything I'm doing today because of him. And it's just it's just an honor doing the work that I do. I love it. Now, so if you um, shifted to this this very spe- uh, specific, you know, niche within chiropractic, was it when your son was born or was it something you were wanting to do before then? Because you've been in practice longer than three to four years, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been in practice for 17 years now. And I had a family practice the whole time. You know, I took care of pregnancy and postpartum and babies, but like kids and grandparents and dads, the whole thing. But I would, I'd always loved that pregnancy and babies um, world. It just, you know, my practice was more general. But when my son was born, going through, we went through hypnobirthing and we ended up doing a home birth, but we had consulted with an OB that's um, fantastic in town. Dr. Cap is his name. Um, just to be in case if we needed to do a hospital transfer, we wanted him to be our guy. And then everything went great. We had an amazing home birth. Um, but it, in that next year, the woman who Uh, taught our hypnobirthing class and Dr. Cap concepted this prenatal wellness center that I'm now a part of and asked me to be a part of it. And so they asked me to be the chiropractor here. And we have an acupuncturist, a massage therapist, all prenatally oriented. And we have a prenatal yoga program. We have lactation consultants here. We teach hypnobirthing and newborn care classes. And we have fit for baby and all kinds of awesome things. So it's definitely a pregnancy world. And so by being invited into that when we opened up three years ago, I was doing two halftime practices. I, I maintained my other practice, which is um, down south in downtown San Diego, and up in I'm in, in northern San Diego now, about a half hour away. And I did two halftime gigs, but I really wanted this to develop and blossom. And over the year that I was first here, I did so, and it got to the point where I really wanted to open this up more. So I closed my other practice and transferred all my clients down there to other Kairos that were doing great work down south and so then I could be up here 100 percent fascinating I I love that you know your your journey to become a parent also influenced your journey professionally because a lot of times it happens but not necessarily in that direction you know docs sometimes end up changing their office hours or maybe um, you know their their timing of, of how quickly they want to see people or other things they want to engage in because they want to be home with their kids more and mm-hmm. for you, it was like having a child really springboarded you into this whole other new path of your career. Yeah. And everybody had said in practice that, you know, if you want to see more kids, have a kid, you know, <laughs> not that you go out and like have a baby just to like develop a pediatric practice. But obviously, like as your interests change and shift, then your practice follows in that way. Right. And but this quite literally with the birth of my son, then with those contacts that I had made and being offered into it, it was just this amazing opportunity that, you know, I just I just jumped at it. 
so it was really, you know, becoming a dad and being more interested in that, but then also professionally, this opportunity that came from becoming a dad in the pregnancy. That must have been a really busy time for you. I'm thinking, you know, you become a dad and now you have, you know, a one practice that's thriving and you will have to fill us in on this after, but I think you might have been podcasting at that point too or... No, it's actually for becoming part of the Cap Wellness Center here and doing all of the prenatal work that the idea of doing a podcast came. And it was probably about six months after we opened the Cap Wellness Center that I started podcasting. So still within a net, like a really close period of time where you had a lot of different things happening, you know, you're adjusting to life with a, with a newborn, right? Mm -hmm. You got a busy yeah. practice. Now you're merging to a new practice and then you start a, you know, the podcast were there things that you felt were really overwhelming during that time? And, and how did you manage it or how did you prioritize your time? Because so many docs go through these times in their life where there's, you know, so many plates spinning all the time and trying to focus on one area can be really difficult. Yeah. I mean, and parenthood just takes that to a whole new level, right? You know, I've always been somebody that has tons of different projects and, you know, trying to prioritize. But then, you know, Fatherhood changed me in that, you know, Nico is the priority. You know, my son's name's Nico. So with that, the I only had the one practice um, when my son was born. It wasn't until a year later that uh, I was doing the kind of two halftime practices. But, you know, in that first year, I mean, you're not – you're not sleeping, you're stressing all the time around. I mean, even though I was in the biz and I knew a lot about kiddos, it's different at two in the morning when <laughs> things are going sideways and you can't think straight. And it's, it's just, it was really overwhelming. And it took, I, I mean, my practice like was really forgiving in that they understood, okay, I'm tired. And I, I, I definitely shrunk down my hours so I could be home um, more. That was really important to me. And I was able to cluster things in a really great way. Um, but then with opening of the two practices, that, that was really hard. I'm, I'm definitely not, I didn't love that year of transition. I knew I wanted to move to one practice up here at the prenatal wellness center, but I wasn't willing to kind of like burn the boats, if you will, and just close that practice or sell it and then come up here. I, I was, I wanted to transition, but it was hard because it meant less time at home. And that was really important to me. But I had a discussion with Effie and with myself around, okay, this year is a transition year. I'm going to do everything I can to like keep things as balanced as possible, but I have to lead with this business life right now so that in the next year things can switch and I'm not commuting. I'm not half my brain in one practice and half of my brain in the other, which, which was challenging for me. You think like, well, I'm working the same amount of hours. It's just in two different places. It definitely made me more scattered. It, mm. um, I don't know if other people, other chiros have done that better and can do that better. I just know that I, I didn't, it was, it was stressful for me and it just became more and more so a, a motivation to get things going at the prenatal wellness center that much more. And the podcast was definitely part of that, um, so that I could be in one place and just anchor in. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably something that many of us can relate to. I mean, I certainly can. I know when I was, after I went through a divorce and I was rebuilding, you know, I found a property I wanted to build and then I was renovating it, selling my house. My sons at that time were three and seven, active, mm. boy, you know, two boys, active already, <laughs> but also one playing, you know, competitive level hockey and just a lot of things happening. And, you know, at that point, you know, the practice was, it was stable, I would say. It wasn't, it wasn't in a growth mode. And I know there's, you know, there's that yes. saying you can't be growing um, and in survival mode at the same time. So I think it's a reminder for all of us sometimes that when we're in these crazy times of our lives, if things stay stable, I mean, obviously sometimes they drop and then we have to pick things back up. But if they stay stable, that's actually okay in those big times of transition because you really can't, just like in the human body, you can't be growing uh, when no. you're in, you know, you're in a destructive mode internally as well, right? Right. And the time that this other opportunity came up to be at the prenatal wellness center. It was a year after Nico um, was born. And in that year, my practice definitely went down. Like I was changing priorities. I wasn't working as much. I wasn't putting as much energy into it. So it definitely wasn't growing. It was relatively stable. It shrunk a bit. But at that year mark, I was like, all right, I need to like get things going again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then with this opportunity that it just was the opportunity I needed to grow a full-time practice. It was just going to be under another 
set of four walls. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So it, it was something that I needed to at that point of to up my level as far as practice and business life. And instead of doing it on my own in my practice, which I could have done, this other opportunity came around. I'm like, you know what? This is really what I want to be doing. This is what my, my heart um, sings with. So let me let me jump into that and and, you know, see how it goes. And if it didn't if it didn't fly, then I'd still have my other practice and go back to that. But thankfully, it didn't go that way. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you've had a vision for, you know, this this type of work that you're doing right now for quite some time. And then things serendipitously <laughs> lined up that way for you. And you're not going to you're not going to pass up those opportunities. But it also sounds to me like you and your partner really were clear, like you said earlier, you know, you were clear with yourself and, and with your wife that this was going to be a transition year. And maybe things were going to get mm -hmm. a little hectic and a little crazy, but that your big picture vision was where you were headed. And so that it, it, that must have helped you stay grounded on the process. Yeah. And less stressed within all of the stress of it. Right. Because part of my stress would have been if I didn't have that conversation and that kind of reality check of, man, I'm working so hard. Like I really should be home. I really should be doing this, you know, and feeling like I'm letting household down by putting all this energy into business rather than into family life. But because we had that agreement, then I could do and put the pedal to the metal in that type of way without the guilt part of it. So then when I came home, like I could be fully there without being, and that's just, that's just the way I operate that I would, would have felt guilty about <clears throat> not helping out as much at home, but it was because I was doing this other thing that ultimately would be better for our family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think like most, most situations, communication is always a key and if you mm -hmm. and your partner were communicating, you know, your ideas and working together on it, I'm sure it, it eased some of that transition as well. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, like, Nico, my son is, I call him an, an accelerator because, like, when he just, being a parent just allows you to cut to the chase that much quicker. Um, I'm sure all parents listening to this can understand that, that just priorities get really clear of what's important and what's not. And, you know, Effie and I had good communication before, but nothing like what we had to dial into, whether it was like with this situation we're talking about or, you know, laying boundaries with the grandmas and, you know, those kind of things. <laughs> it just, it, it's been really helpful, more difficult sometimes in like setting boundaries, but really helpful in that boundaries are set. Um, the, and that's definitely something that parenthood has then helped me in practice life because we're setting boundaries and um, having to, you know, use communication in our businesses all the time. And so that's something that's really, really served me. Uh, it, it was a growth process <laughs> for yeah. sure, but uh, it's definitely like allowed me to stride much more powerfully now. I often think that children are brought into our lives so that we can complete our growth process as humans mm. <laughs> because I don't know, your little guy's only four, but mine are, you know, 16 and, and 12 and I'm constantly learning from them. And I give them a lot of credit for helping me become a better person because no one t tests you more than, you know, those sometimes the people that you love the most. Amen. I mean, that is <laughs> in spades. Like, I mean, I can't call, I can't say Nico as a four year old is like calling me on my stuff, but he does as a four year old because <laughs> when I'm not paying attention to him, he lets me know, you know, and he grounds me and be like, hey, let's just play, you know, like, all right, stop trying to be in four different places. Um, and when it comes down to it, it's like, all right, so I only have so much time. I only have so much energy. Where am I going to devote it? So like, am I going to drain it over here or am I going to like put it into the things that really matter to me? And he teaches me that all the time because, you know, as a four year old, they just do what they want to do. <laughs> they have no concept and of time. No, not at all. Time and is now. Whatever's happening right now. Yeah. And there's one, there's one story I love telling in that how pr how present he can make me that we were just playing around in the front room and looking out the window, waiting for the garbage trucks to come. He's like obsessed with the garbage trucks, but we were looking there and a bird flew right in front of us, landed on the bush, looked at us for a second and, and flew away. I didn't think anything of it. I don't even know if I even saw it because I was thinking about a million other things. And Nico saw that and he's like, <gasps> Whoa, did you see that? This bird just flew and landed and went, and it was really cool. 
it was really an amazing thing when it comes down to it. It's just I was so used to it and in my own world that I didn't notice that. So like he and kids do that. They just bring us into the more present moment because they they're they're there. Whereas us as adults, we get going and lose sight on things a lot. So he's been a great teacher for me. Mm-hmm. Speaking of you know you being present, that's something that a lot of docs can use a reminder of, myself included. Um, what do you do to shift yourself from Dr. J mode to dad mode? Like, do you have anything specific that you do when you're um, walking into the house or just your mindset or, 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 you know, a lot of chiropractors are on all the time and they find it really hard right. to shut their brains off, especially when they're entrepreneurs as well. Right. No, it's definitely been a challenge and I've gotten better and better at it. I can definitely, you know, do more, but I had even more of a challenge actually when I didn't have as long a commute because my commute was my transition time. I had a half hour where I was in the car either on the way down or on the way up. And that was my time to kind of let the say work life day go, decompress it, maybe finish up a call that I needed to like follow up on and then get ready before I <laughs> walked in through the door and who who knows what was gonna what kind of chaos was going on there. Um, but now that I only live a couple minutes away, I don't have that same buffer of time. So I have to be more diligent about closing up the day as far as even just logistics of, all right, let me, I don't have anything else that I need to do now, but really being present of, okay, the day is gone. Then this is the car ride. It's only a couple minutes um, long, but to use that of kind of in my mind, process the day of what it is. So I'm not thinking about it when I'm at dinner or trying to get Nico to brush his teeth or put him to sleep or those kind of things, but then be ready to be present walking through the door because, and something that's helped in a communication sense, um, Effie will, I text her when I'm leaving the office so she knows. And part of that also is like, what do I need to know when I walk through the door? (laughs) So I'm not getting blindsided by like, he hasn't eaten, he hasn't napped today. And it's just craziness in the house, those kind of things. So I can be better prepared. And part of a ritual is, you know, I walk through the house, say hi to everybody, give hugs, how's everybody doing? And then I go change clothes. And that's a time for me to like be in the house and transition. It only takes a couple minutes, but it's, it's a little buffer. So that's, Mm. that's been helpful. Um, and the last thing I would say that I've been um, much better at is I, I turn the phone off until Nate goes to sleep because that's something that I was, I was not good at. I could always be checking something and following up. And especially when you have an online business or a podcast, like it's always on, you know, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not like, all right, there's no patience in front of me because I'm at home, but that business life and, oh, that one idea, I should remember to do that. And let me fire off this email that, that that's ever present. So it's really important to try and separate that out. I'm getting better and better at it, but I can definitely, (laughs) definitely improve sometimes. Yeah. And what I find is as my sons have gotten older, there was times when having technology was brilliant because I could be at the park with my kids and be dealing with, you know, things on, on my laptop while they were playing. Right. So it was great because it allowed me to be in both places at once. And sometimes, um, Mm -hmm. but as they've gotten older, you know, they are more perceptive about screen time because they know that their mom doesn't want them on their, you know, PS4 and watching videos and, and on computers all the time too. So they keep me honest about it as well because um, I have to model, you know, their behavior and, and they're old enough now that they want to know the why. So now I have to tell them, explain yeah. to them, like, look, like, look, being at, looking at a screen for this many hours is just not good for your health and this is why. So again, another way that children will keep us accountable to our own behaviors <laughs> yeah. as they get older. Right. Okay, you're right. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> so let's talk about the podcast. I mean, you have a wildly mm-hmm. successful podcast. Obviously, the, the niche Thank is you. something that you have been working towards and you got this opportunity to work in this wellness center and then the podcast just evolved from that, like, tell us a little bit more about mm-hmm. how that started for you and why you wanted to do a podcast. Right. Well, you know, I had never really considered doing a podcast myself. It wasn't this like, you know, life dream I had of being a podcaster. It was more of when I became part of the Cap Wellness Center and we had all these amazing practitioners underneath this roof that the idea was born because we have in this in this center where the Cap Wellness Center is affiliated with Dr. Cap and his um, his prenatal wellness or his prenatal um, 
practice next door and we have an integrated care agreement. So anybody that comes into the office, whether they're a patient of mine or an acupuncturist or Dr. Caps, they sign a waiver. So HIPAA compliance wise, we can as practitioners look at the records, talk with each other so we can have amazing eyeballs like looking at someone um and help them along so if i'm having a struggle with something i can act as acupuncturist hipaa compliance wise well so with that model we knew that a woman coming in wasn't necessarily going to be seeing all of us as practitioners and receiving services and re- receiving their advice but i wanted to make a library of information for them and so i've always been much more of an audio person than a video person and much more than a writer so my idea was, well, let me do record audio interviews and then I'll figure out some way of getting that information to these patients. And I was, I've, I've been kind of techie and website, build websites and things like that. So I'm thinking like, all right, how am I going to archive this? How are they going to have access? And all of a sudden it hit me like, duh, that's called a podcast. You know? <laughs> so I took, so then I had, um, been kind of following Dr. Ed Osborne. He's the one that taught me all this stuff that I do with podcasting. And I talked with him about that thing. And so it was like, yeah, that's a natural way of um, starting a podcast. So the idea was born from just interviewing the people locally within the Cap Wellness Center. But then through talking with Ed about it was, you know, that's a way that you could, you know, really network with the people in San Diego in your natural birth community and, you know, pick their brains and learn and have more resources as well as become known within the community more. And then if you want to, then you can go nationally as well. And that's exactly what happened. So I started by interviewing the people that were here and launched the podcast that way. And then because the podcast, as you know, like it opens up a lot of doors, you know, there's people in town that I've known, but I could then call up and say, Hey, I'm doing this podcast. I'd love to interview about prenatal fitness and pick your brain about it and have our listeners learn from you. And people say yes. And so the more yeses I got, the more episodes were in there because it was niched. I and when I launched, it was back when the new and noteworthy was a pretty significant part. I don't know when you launched your podcast, if yeah, that was part was of your a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it so was big was for a while. When I first ago, launched, yeah. it was a it was a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that definitely helped. So like with that advice, I just followed what he said and like launched with the episodes, got as many reviews as I could within the first three days. And I was on the top of the new and noteworthy for those eight weeks. And so that was a lot of exposure there. But so with the download numbers that were coming in, because I pregnant women were looking for information and there just wasn't that much back then. There's a lot more now. There's great. There, there's awesome um, pregnancy oriented podcasts now. Um, the more download numbers I had, then I could reach out to even bigger names within the um, birth community. And because I had shown that one, I'd been around for a while and people were listening, they were more likely to say yes. So I could get the Sarah Buckley's and the Bruce Lipton's and um, the Dr. Carps on the show. And that then built even more listenership because once they were on, they would share it with their lists and it just had built and built and built. So my initial reasoning for doing it wasn't all of this to like be able to have Bruce Lipton on the show and to be able to talk with all the people in the ICPA and all those people. But it, it came from it. And it really was the ideas that Ed had given me of this is how you could build your own authority within that niche and then use it to be able to, uh, you know, develop one that w- yourself within that niche. But then it's also just a really strong anchor for the practice. You know, there's people that come in all the time that, you know, they say like, who can we refer on our paperwork? It says, who can we um, thank for referring you into the office? And like podcast is oftentimes on there. Now it wasn't because they just arbitrarily in San Diego, like started searching for podcasts. They were probably referred to it by some reason, but they, they got to know me they got to know my, um, my take on things and what I was wanting to accomplish that fit for them. And then they came in and they kind of knew the information we were able to roll from it. So that's been really helpful. And I also use that as, you know, continuity of like sending them podcast episodes to keep them engaged and keep them interested and to kind of go over subjects that might be coming up, topics that might be coming up in their patient visit, but then they can listen to it, um, 
listen to it at home at their leisure and then we can talk about it the next time so the podcast has been super helpful just in practice but it's also opened up a lot of doors with doing a lot of the speaking stuff that i'm going to get to do this year yeah what comes to mind is is just the relationship building you know for you building Mm -hmm. relationships as you said first in your local community with other professionals and then within people in your practice who are getting to know you it's like you're really pre-qualifying people before they come in, you know, to, to see, yes. they know what they're going to get. They know what Dr. J is going to be like, what his, his views are on, you know, all these different birth topics. And then it's allowed you to also establish these amazing relationships with other people internationally, uh, which I would have to say my experience, you know, being a podcaster as well has, has certainly been the same. Yes. It's, and it's something that just because you've had them on the show doesn't necessarily mean that you can't, you you still have to nurture that relationship, right? You know, and it's something that is amazing. Like once they've been on, like you, you have a rapport and you've had a conversation and it's just a great time. I love, I love podcasting. (laughs) I always have, I wouldn't have over a hundred episodes if I didn't like it. Right. But then it's, you know, you reach out and be like, Hey, I just saw this thing. I thought you might really like it. And so I'll send things to them and vice versa. And it just, it builds and builds and it's, it's a great way of, one starting a relationship because like you start by having them on the podcast, but then, you know, you, you think of them and they send them stuff or you refer them to other podcasts that they might want to be on or resources or, you know, there's tons of times now where there's something clinically going on and I'm like, you know what, she would know the answer to this. Let me reach out and see if she'll, um, she'll answer the question. And you know, the people are really generous. I found it, they're really generous with their time and expertise. And that's, that's been a huge benefit. Mm-hmm. Something that we've talked about, and we have to give uh, you know Dr. Ed some credit here. I don't know if he'll be listening. I'm gonna try to get him to listen to the show, but <laughs> that's actually how we met is, is through some of his programs. Yeah. You know, it's a great program. Uh, he's been a tremendous value to me as well. So thank you, Dr. Ed. Um, but would you say you know that everyone should podcast? Because I don't know if I would say that. I think that you definitely have to look at you know what your specific skill sets are. Like I said, you mm-hmm. love doing it. I love having conversation with people. I'm really comfortable doing it probably from my own experiences, you know, in television and then in the practice and then just having all these conversations. But do you think that anyone could start up and do a podcast and do a great job? Or do you think there are some things that people should consider before they take this jump if they wanted to? Yeah, I, I, definitely that. I don't think podcasting is for everyone. I mean, can ever can anyone launch a podcast and put some episodes out? Absolutely, because it's it's not that difficult. But to be good at it and for it to be impactful, like audio needs to be your your niche and like your your world, right? So people you know, in the business world, they're saying, you know, like either are you a writer? Do you like writing things? Do you like talking about things or do you like shooting videos? Like there's, those are the three main mediums, right? And, Mm -hmm. and in a business sense, it's helpful to have it in all three. But for me, audio has been something that I really enjoy. Like, so it's, it's a conversation, which my show is like yours. It's interview format because I like, having the dialogue and learning and asking questions. That's how I've always been Um, versus I've done some monologues, some solo episodes, which I enjoy well, which is kind of like teaching and lecturing in that kind of sense. But I definitely like the, um, the interview format more. So what I would say to a person if they're considering podcasting is definitely. So the first thing I would say, as far as the tech part, like don't let the tech part like scare you. Like if you really enjoy podcasting, you like doing it and you think you'd be good at it, you can get other people to do the tech part or it's not that hard to learn the tech. So don't let the tech thing be a barrier. But if you're like engaging with people, you like talking with them, or you like just lecturing and talking um, and doing solo shows, then this could be a really great venue. I find audio and podcasting way easier than video. For some reason with me, like setting up the camera and making sure everything's looking right and the lighting and all that kind of stuff, I get wrapped around the axle with that kind of stuff. So it's more of a barrier to me, whereas audio... I'm really comfortable with it. And so podcasting has been something that's been really fun to do. So I keep doing it rather than it being like, oh, I really should. I really should. You know, if, if you're coming from a point like, well, look at all these great podcasts that are out there and look at what it's done for all these people. I should really do one, too. 
that's enough to, that should be enough for you to look into it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that will be the best thing for you. It might be like you need to write it, um, and write and do um, blog posts and article submissions, those kind of things, or it might be video. Um, there's a lot of trending going on saying that audio is going to become even bigger in the next couple of years than video. Video has been really kind of king in the last um, couple of years, but there's a lot of trending with podcasting becoming bigger and bigger and with people being so busy and wanting to multitask. They're listening to podcasts while they're working out or while they're driving, commuting, or doing stuff in the, um, in the house that they wouldn't sit down and watch a video for. So there's a lot of growth going on in podcasting, but, um, it isn't, it isn't for everybody because I'm sure you've seen in iTunes, there's lots of shows that have like four episodes and then they stopped, you know, right. because it wasn't for them. And that's, that's no like judgment on them. That they shouldn't do it. It's just, they discover, right, that's not for me. Yeah, I agree with so much of what you said. I think, I mean, let's all forget there's a time commitment. You know, you've got to be able oh, yeah. to oh, make yeah. the time totally. for it. I mean, I, you know, I always tell moms, you know, like my boys are, you know, 16 and 12. So my time that, you know, that they require from me is much different now than it was five years ago or, or, or you know, 16 years ago when they, were, when they were newborns. I would never have had the time at that point in my life or career to devote to this. So some things will happen and you'll get more freedom for some of that stuff as time goes on with your kids. But I also love the audio component because, you know, from having done a ton of TV where, you know, you've got to spend the time, you got to get the hair done and the makeup done and the clothes. And there's some, so much more that goes on to making yourself look good on, on camera, you know, whether it's in a TV studio or in your own home office. And for me, I love it. I mean, right now you and I are talking. It's almost nine o'clock at night here where I'm standing. I got my shoes off. I'm really comfortable. <laughs> you know, it's, um, there's such freedom that's for me attached to having an audio conversation that, uh, you know, video, you've got to, you've got to look, look your best ideally. So yeah. I like that freedom as well. But I also would add on like what you said about delegating your tasks. You know, if you don't want to produce your shows, don't produce them. I mean, I, I've been at different times in my podcasting. I thought, Oh, I, you know, I know I could probably do it. I'm sure I could learn. And again, there's been great tutorials and stuff that Ed's thrown out there about how to do it, but I really had no interest. And so I found a guy Former, he's a patient of mine, you know, used to be a music producer, he's retired. He loves doing it. He, you know, converts the file for me, he does all the tech stuff, sends me back a file so that I don't have to focus on any of that stuff. So just like your practice life, if you decide you want to pursue a podcast, you can absolutely delegate some of the things you don't want to do so that you can focus on doing what you love. Right. I mean, I know a podcaster that she basically goes for a walk, records her episode into her phone and then turns it off and then a podcast is produced by it because once it's closed it uploads to her g drive the person who does her podcast downloads it produces it and throws it in so it can be that simple mm -hmm. um, i don't do it that way i do a lot of it myself but at the same time it's again like the tech is the part that can be definitely farmed out like the podcast because it's you and it's your personality and you putting yourself out there and you're wanting your patients or whoever's listening to it to be familiar with you. Like you have to do that part. So it's like whatever can get you to the point that you turn on the mic on and press record and go is it, that's what should be motivating you. And the, and the, the tech part doesn't have to be a, a, a barrier. No, and I think like so many different parts of practice, it's knowing what you're good at and having confidence yes. in that and spending time investing in your skills and finding other people to help you with some of their, your weak spots. I don't think podcasting is any different. I also no. think it's important to, I mean, think about your why. Like when you think about why do you want all these people to get this information about natural birth, about all the, you know, the different scenarios, about how to handle them, about how to deal with you know, midwives or cord clamping or breastfeeding or whatever. Like what was your main why and your vision for getting this information out there? Well, I mean, the biggest why that I have is because I want these babies coming into the world more safely and more gently so they don't come in and damaged and they can start off their lives without the stress and the health problems that a lot of times babies are coming in because the pregnancy and the birth went sideways. Um, I joke with the pregnant <laughs> pregnant women that I take care of is like, yeah, I'm, I'm not really doing any of this for you. I'm doing this for your baby. So I want your <laughs> baby coming in. Well, I want you to have an easy, great birth, but I really want it for your kiddo. And they understand where I'm coming from. But as far as the information in the podcast, 
there's just so much, I don't want to say, well, it is misinformation about things, but there's so many women that just don't know any different. And especially in obstetrics, there's still, you know, a patriarchal domination of like, well, the myobi said it has to be this way. And the more empowered a woman is and dads too, I'm, I'm starting to do a lot more with dads, um, to be advocates and to be involved, but mainly for the moms, like to just know the information about it so they can have a conversation with their birth provider and make different choices. If that information yields something that they want to go a different way, rather than what we were seeing when we first opened the, um, Capuano center here, we were getting a lot of second time moms coming in, wanting to take hypnobirthing, wanting to do prenatal yoga, wanting to get adjusted throughout their pregnancy. So their birth was better because the first time was a train wreck. And if we can do this work by putting out information with the podcast and teaching classes and exposing them to these, to this information to make better choices, then they don't have to have the first birth go sideways so that their second, third, and fourth, if they choose, be more natural and better. It can, it can start with the first kiddo. Mm-hmm. And that that's really important. We're starting to see that now that at least where I live in San Diego, like natural birth is definitely more commonplace and people are seeking that out. Um, but obviously by the success of the podcast and it being all over the world and people, you know, asking me questions like, where can I find a cap wellness center in, in my neck of the woods? Like it, it's definitely being sought after. And so if, whether or not they have that in their town, I, we can try and find them practitioners that are congruent with this kind of message and this philosophy um, so that women can have a healthier pregnancy and a better birth, the babies can have a better pregnancy and better birth, and the whole family can start off healthy and sound and safe rather than oftentimes what happened is that postpartum period is really difficult because the birth was, it didn't go the way that it, uh, it could have had they known this type of information. Mm-hmm. I think it's amazing. It's such a great, uh, you know, service and influence that you're providing for all these, you know, women and, and dads too, you know, obviously listening across the world about what they can be doing to ensure their, their children do come into this world the most safe way possible. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, you've been an influencer in this department. Who are some of your influences on the kind of chiropractor that you are? Did you do any programs or coaching or, you know, have any uh, family influences, you know, growing up that really got you to be the kind of doc that you are? Yeah, I've been fortunate to have a lot of mentors along the line. Um, I specialize in lower force techniques. And so there were a lot of coaches I had in the um, beginning of my career that were really anchored in um, those things. Like Donnie Epstein is the the founder of the network spinal analysis. That's the foundation of things. And when I was first discovering what chiropractic was, he was really impactful in learning that technique along with the traditional techniques in chiropractic school. But then, you know, in school too, it was Jeannie Ohm that really kind of knocked my socks off when I was learning about (laughs) all the things that could be done with pediatrics and pregnancy. And, you know, she, if you've heard Jeannie Ohm, like she talks about her unassisted home births all the time. And that was so outside of my paradigm back in chiropractic school, but something resonated with me. And I had a home birth, like I I really wanted a home birth for my son because of what I heard from Jeannie and, you know, with doing all this stuff with pediatrics and now working more with the ICPA, like that she's kind of come back around and she's been a huge impact over these last couple of years on me of one, just increasing my skills and my knowledge about that. But then also like, I mean, she's just such a huge heart and such a giver and has such a huge big picture that instead of getting caught in the you know, specifics of either techniques or certain things that are going on in a, a little one's spine. It's, it's a bigger picture of like, all right, why are we doing this? Like, why are we like, let's get the stress out of their systems. So they can really be who they're designed to be. So it's it, those, those two are like the major, major impacts that really shaped like what I get to do today. You know, I think now you're making me recall, like, I mean, I, my son Max was born four days after I graduated from CMCC. So I was, you know, pregnant in my internship, but, you know, obviously like learning about it. And I know having done my fellowship with the ICBA, hearing um, Jeannie speak so many times and I'm sure she came to CMCC, I'm going to also give her credit for my home births because I don't (laughs) think before chiropractic school, I had ever entertained that thought. And 
Um, you know, I had two amazing home births and, and, you know, my kids' lives have forever been improved because of that, you know, that first experience. And um, even some of the other things that she brought up during some of her lectures about, you know, do you want to have an ultrasound or not? Or these are some things to look at with breastfeeding and um, certainly a powerful influence on my life as well. So thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just retook the Webster seminar um, just a few weeks ago in Dallas and learned a ton more, you know, because obviously like when I was for, I've taken it a couple of times, but every time you go back with it, you know, different questions and you hear different things and, you know, she, she's a huge impact and I, I'm really happy to hear that she did the same for you because I, I don't think I would have thought of that. You know, I definitely was more naturally oriented, but, and I knew in chiropractic school, like, all right, it's not really up to me whether or not my kid, whoever this kid is that I'm going to have later on in life is going to be a home birth. It's up to mom, whoever mom turns out to be. It just turns out like Effie was definitely on board. That was what she was familiar with and what she wanted. So we were on the same page. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll give the ICP another plug. You know, their magazine, Pathways to Family Wellness, is a great thing to bring into your practice. I've brought them in in, in bulk and given them out to all the families here and I've taken them to the midwives clinics and, and really left them anywhere around my community where I could leave them and it's a really great way to support the organization further. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way of educating the parents out there and practitioners for that matter that you're talking about the midwife's office yeah, because the articles are fantastic. It's a great ma magazine, period, but it's really grounded in the principles that we work with. And so then it prompts those questions like, ooh, I want that. Where can I get it? And, you know, the, it brings people into your office. Mm -hmm. Well, we are going to run out of time here, and I wish we weren't because uh, there's lots of things I'd like to still ask you. But uh, why, one last question for you, Jay, is going to be, you know, given where you're at now and everything you've gone through in practice the last 17 years and you have a four-year-old and a lovely wife and you're doing the podcast, like, how do you define success for yourself? Well, you know, that answer for me has evolved a lot over the years because when I started, it was all about kind of the traditional success definitions of how many patients, how much money, all those kind of things. And, you know, as you hit those goals or targets that you set, they, they get bigger and more and you never, at least for me, I never felt like, all right, I'm not really successful because there's always more and there's always somebody doing more and the like. And so for me now, especially because I have so many irons in the fire and one of those irons is my son, <laughs> that really success for me in practice is, am I making an impact? Am I making a difference? And that is definitely not quality or quantitative it's more of a feeling that i have and also i know am i fully present in practice and can i be here now without thinking about home and when i'm home am i fully here now and not thinking about practice if i'm handling all of the areas of my life well not perfect because i love thinking i'm perfect but i had to give that up <laughs> a long time ago because um, i'm not and i'm not very good at being perfect um then I can feel like I'm making an impact and I'm making a difference and I'm doing good work and that's success to me. And when I'm feeling like I'm on, on task and I'm enjoying my life, that's successful to me. So I know that's kind of a wishy-washy answer maybe and it's not very uh, quanti quantitative, but that's, that's where I've evolved to now instead of looking at those you know, numbers. Yeah, but I think it's a brilliant answer. I mean, you are defining your life by how you're feeling and the impact you're making and you know, not only by how busy you are in your practice. You're looking at, which I think for a lot of docs, you know, is how, at least it's also how I was taught to measure my success. And it wasn't just my success mm -hmm. in practice. I was also attaching my success as a human being to how busy I was in practice. Yeah. And when I was able to really step back and think, wait a second, what does Melissa really want here? And part of that for me is, is being, you know, really connected to my sons. And what did that look like for me? It means that I wanted to have certain hours that I was home with them. And it means that I wanted to structure my practice in such a way that I had more freedom. So I think it's an individual thing. But I love that you articulated it for yourself and that it's, it's how you're feeling and how you're performing in all those different functions and roles that you find yourself in. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Listeners, I will be sure to put in the links to everything you need to know about Dr. J, including how to reach him, but also uh, the link to his podcast, which you're definitely going to put on uh, next time you're in your car. If you want to learn something, you refresh yourself about all topics related to having a healthy birth for a healthy baby. And uh, thanks again for your time, Jay. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a really fun time being here. I like it. 
Thanks for being here today. If you like this show, please share it with another chiropractor and connect them with this message. We are always better off together than we are alone. If you haven't yet subscribed, head on over to Apple Podcasts or iTunes, and don't forget to rate and review the show while you're there. Be sure to connect with me on Instagram and Facebook, and find out more about today's guests and all things Rockstar Doctor Life by clicking in those show notes. See you next time.